The Hidden Rules of Airport Minimums – What Airlines Expect You to Know Welcome to Captain's Chair, where I expose the airline industry's best-kept secrets. If you're watching because you think understanding airport operating minimums is just about checking if the ceiling is above your minimums… Congratulations! You've fallen for aviation's equivalent of thinking brain surgery is just about having a steady hand. The reality? Airport operating minimums for airline pilots is to basic weather minimums what chess is to tic-tac-toe. Technically, both involve rules, but one requires significantly more strategic thinking. I'm Captain James, and after decades flying the Airbus fleet, I've seen countless new pilots struggle with the complexity of airline minimums, often because flight schools barely scratch the surface of what you'll actually need to know. Today, I'm diving into the world of Airport Operating Minimums, or AOMs as we call them, both before and after the parking brake is released. I'll walk you through the captain's approach that separates the professionals from the people who think RVR is just another aviation acronym to memorise for their checkride. And by the way, if you want to master this material, I've created templates for breaking down these rules in my command books on Amazon. You just need to fill in the blanks for your own area of operations. Before we continue, many of you have been asking about the resources I use to prepare my videos. I've actually compiled my 30 plus years of aviation experience into two book series available on Amazon. The Smoky Chronicles, my humorous take on aviation life that pilots can't stop laughing about, and the Professional Airline Pilot series, which include comprehensive technical guides for serious career advancement. Both available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. The links are in the description. Now. Back to our video. Let's start with pre-dispatch minimums. What you need to know before the parking brake is released. Most new pilots think checking weather is just glancing at a meter and confirming the ceiling and visibility are above minimums. Essentially, the aviation equivalent of checking if it's raining before deciding to bring an umbrella. What separates airline pilots from general aviation pilots is understanding that pre-dispatch weather assessment is a comprehensive analysis involving multiple documents and considerations. This is something I do every single day I go flying. I'm not just looking at METARs and TAFs, I'm analysing SIGMETs for en route hazards, wind charts for jet streams and turbulence, and high-level significant weather charts to identify potential weather areas along our route. For your destination, you need to ensure the weather meets the required criteria for your planned approach. This means comparing the reported and forecast weather with the low weather minima operations listed on the port page of your electronic flight bag, as well as any Yeperson or state-specific minima and your airline's specific cutoffs. And yes, these different sets of minima often have varying values, and you'll need to understand which ones are controlling for your operation. It's like the difference between checking the weather app on your phone and conducting a meteorological investigation worthy of a crime drama. I once watched a new first officer confidently declare our destination was above minimums, only to discover he'd completely missed the fact that we were planning a Category 2 approach, which has entirely different requirements than the Category 1 approach he'd been looking at. His face resembled someone who just realised they'd been studying for a history exam when they were actually taking calculus. But pre-dispatch is just the beginning. What really separates airline pilots from the rest is understanding what happens after the parking brake is released, when the rules become even more specific and the stakes get higher. For takeoff, all reported runway visual range values must be at or above the minimums on your company's low weather minima operations page. If you're using RVR values in parentheses, then the touchdown, midpoint, and rollout, RVR, must all be available and meet or exceed the specified minima. If RVR isn't reported, the captain can assess it by noting the number of runway lights visible, keeping in mind that ICAO standard spacing for runway lights is 60 meters. This isn't just academic knowledge, it's the difference between a legal takeoff and a potential violation. I once had a colleague who misunderstood the requirement for all three RVR values to be available when using parenthetical minimums. He was about to commence takeoff when I pointed out that the midpoint RVR transmissometer was unserviceable. His confident demeanour quickly transformed into the look of someone who just narrowly avoided stepping off a cliff. For landing, the complexity increases even further. 
you'll use the landing minima, including any crosswind limits, to continuously assess the suitability of the airport. If RVR is not available for Category 1 or non-precision approaches, the reported visibility becomes the limiting factor and should be treated in the same way as RVR. And critically, no factoring of these minima is allowed after the planning stage. You also need to understand the specific RVR requirements for different approach categories. For Category 1 approaches, while midpoint RVR is generally not reported, if it is, there are minimum values required. For Category 2 approaches, the touchdown RVR is controlling, and at many airlines, the midpoint RVR is also designated as controlling, with rollout RVR being advisory. There are also specific situations where you cannot commence an approach below 1,000 feet above aerodrome level unless the RVR is above published minima. The visibility is above 800 meters or published minima, whichever is higher, and the ceiling, if required, is above published minima. It's like the difference between following a simple recipe and performing molecular gastronomy. Both involve cooking, but one requires precision, timing, and understanding complex interactions. I once observed a captain attempt to commence a Category 2 approach when the RVR transmissometer was unserviceable. When the first officer gently pointed out that Category 2 approaches require RVR availability, the captain's expression was priceless, like someone who'd just been told their parachute was actually a backpack. So, what does all this mean for you as an aspiring airline pilot? It means that understanding airport operating minimums is not just about memorizing numbers, it's about developing a systematic approach to weather assessment and decision-making. Start by building a structured method for reviewing weather and minima. Create your own template that forces you to actively engage with every critical element. Don't just note the numbers. Understand why they exist and how they contribute to flight safety. Practice making go-no-go -no -go decisions based on complex weather scenarios. Don't just ask, is it above minimums? Ask, which minimums apply in this specific situation? What if conditions change? What's my plan B? The good news. You don't need to wait until you're in airline training to start building these habits. You can begin incorporating this level of detail into your flight planning right now, giving you a massive advantage when you eventually step into an airline environment. If this episode saved you from the shock of discovering that airline weather minimums are to basic VFR, IFR minimums, what quantum physics is to basic arithmetic. Hit subscribe and join me next week when we dive into another critical aspect of airline operations that flight schools conveniently forget to mention. This is Captain James, signing off from the captain's chair, where we tell you what they don't want you.